No one, no one knows, no one, no one knows We all woke up in an upside down Turning inside out like we've all been led astray We've been standing on the outside in Trying to find our friends like we're all just cast away Feel like we've been missing Hello there and welcome back to the sixth installment of all three of us beautiful ladies talking about Harry Potter. I want to welcome for the sixth time Alexis of Ascension Diaries and Jenny Moonstone below. Hello, girls. Hi. Thank you so much for joining me. I am so proud of ourselves. Like we started off this year finishing a pretty big project. I didn't think the Harry Potter series was going to take so much out of us and like brain space, but we have gotten to this point. Um, this is a pretty heavy episode. However, I'm I'm excited to talk about it with you girls. So let's get into it. Yes. And thank you guys again for all of your supportive comments and feedback. We are inspired by your joy. So we're let's get into I know. it. I was heavy, though. I was in the comments of Cassandra's uh, live stream and she's like, their last video was only an hour and a half. I couldn't believe it wasn't longer. We were like oh, yeah. falling asleep. We were like <laughs> so tired with that one. And um, I think <laughs> these videos, the last few are such long books that we have to like just give it an hour and a half. Whereas we were doing like two books at once. So that's why they have gotten a little bit shorter. Um, they take a lot out of us. <laughs> so one moment here, share my screen. So everybody listening to this episode, be sure to drive safe safely and uh, we'll do our best to keep you entertained for the next little while here. <laughs> oh, I forget you. people don't watch my slides because like, I don't know what I'm not. I'm not good at explaining. Hey, this is what we're looking at. So <laughs> what yes. we're looking at this time, again, we're starting off the conversation with, we do not endorse idol worship. Whenever you idol something, you automatically put yourself in a different category and you don't think that you can do it. One thing, um, the Christ figure and the Bible, which is a completely, a really good fiction book people should read. Um, and remember, there's truth in all fiction. They tell us how to suit up for these interesting, heavy spiritual talks. This is a war, not against flesh and blood, but against very evil demons that travel in the ether and our sound waves and our lights. So you are not just protecting your body. You are protecting your entire essence and aura in different dimensions. And the easiest way to do that is to put on the whole armor of God. So please join me. Oh, Heavenly Father, I ask for the whole armor of God, the helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, belt of truth, Wrap my feet in God's gospel. Give me the shield of faith and the sword of the spirit. Um, clean your house. It, it really makes for a very good <laughs> uh, start of the new year. Now, ambition. This entire episode is going to be about Slytherin and the element of water. And Slytherin is known for ambition. And I don't know if you ladies remember uh, when the this this movie came out, I think I was maybe 16 or 17. Um, and when people were at the theaters in the U S at least people were just driving by these long, long lines of Harry Potter fans. And a lot of people never read the books. So there were thousands <laughs> upon thousands of people who never, who were really into the Harry Potter series and the movies made up until then. And then you had all of us reading, who read the books, um, loving to ruin it for some people. And you had these drive-bys of people yelling, Snape kills Dumbledore. And oh, in the it line. was hilarious. It was something you had to be there for. And I wanted to start this off with letting you know, stay, Snape kills Dumbledore in this book movie. Um, 
there's a lot more to it and I wanted to get it out of the way now because we will be talking about stuff that explains why this had to be done and why it wasn't really that big of a deal. Basically, it was almost like a psyop because Dumbledore, we start off this sixth book with Dumbledore already dying. He's he a dead, dead guy walking. It didn't matter. What? He was a dead guy walking. It was already over. It was totally exactly. He was going, he only had a matter of months to live anyway. So it was kind of a show. And also um, it was nice to him because he didn't have to die a like painful death. It was just quick and easy. Does anybody remember like I, the way that he, I don't know if it's how it goes down in the books, but at the very last moment before he uh, hurls the death curse, he looks at Snape and he goes, uh, he says, please. And the way that he says it is like, you know, they everybody around him thinks he's begging for his life. Yeah. But really his last words to him are like, you know, please, like, let's just do this. Let's just do it. it. Wild. I mean, he's hundreds of years old. They said in the third book, I think he's like 360. Like, he's not a young man. And he's seen trauma in his life. Yeah. So, um, okay. We go back to, we've already covered Gryffindor is fire. Hufflepuff is earth. This episode is going to be about Slytherin being water or liquid and Slytherin like traits of a Slytherin house is to have ambition, to be cunning and to be resourceful. Those things itself are not necessarily bad. Okay. However, um, something that happens with ambition is they can be sold out to the highest bidder. And we see this a lot, especially in modern times we currently have a collegiate system which is just trash um anyone who goes to university here in america i don't know any one it's all been taken over and the problem with that is these kids coming out of university they have an ambition which is wonderful ambition itself isn't bad but the collegiate societies have made literally secret societies. They have fraternities. They have Greek, Greek life. life. Yeah, Greek life. So weren't you in a sorority, Alexis? I was in one for a year and I think two years. I quit after two years. They're expensive to stay. And I had a couple friends they in were. them. It was I it. didn't get it. It was awful. <laughs> I Man. mean, I I didn't realize it was going to be as bad as it was. And it. I tried to give them the benefit of the doubt for like a year, two years, mm -hmm. you know. I don't like networking. Uh, basically, when I got into like doing nonprofit work, people would reach out to you. And it was very Greek life. Like yeah. people would reach out to you and they're like, oh, come to our luncheon. I don't do luncheons. I, and I, I used to smoke cigarettes. I'm like, your little luncheon is going to cut into my cigarette break. I don't have time for you. Like, <laughs> I love that for you. <laughs> no, I don't play. I don't talk nice. I roll my eyes way too much. Like you do. I couldn't see you no, doing well in a luncheon. Uh, not now, not 10 years ago. <laughs> no, I can't, I can't even fake the funk. It's bad, no. but that's basically what, uh, Greek life happens after college is you get asked to these networking events and out here in Arizona, especially during 2016 when I was working and stuff, um, everything is very like McCain presence and McCain was just as dirty as like some of these um they're all it's all one big club so like ambition if I was ambitious which thank god I'm not I would have heck I was even casted by Disney if I was ambitious I would have gone to live at Disneyland but I was like a little conspiracy theorist and I was like yo your guys's contract is like I don't know if you know this it's kind of like slavery and I said no to Disney like I'm not ambitious at all yeah so um yeah it's Slytherin in the contract <laughs> I know right <laughs> Slytherins are going to be the ones who are very well known without in throughout society. They're the ones that are going to, and we see it with the Malfoys. They are the popular people of 
the day. They are the people you want to be around. They're the people who get these tickets and it's very much almost a celebrity like influence is the type of influence that um, Slytherins can have. So there's their, um, what is it called? Mascot is going to be the very un understood snake and they're going to control water. So and there's Sally many contracts in this movie as well. It's full of contracts. <laughs> oh my God. Yes. We're going to get into that very soon. So what Alexis just brought up is something that these dark forces, trickster gods, um, small G from Greek mythology are really good at. Uh, the devil plays with contracts. Um, contracts are not i don't think contracts outweigh god's creation or word but it's all about influence if you think an nda is scary an nda will be scary if you know that a your united states constitution and bill of rights allows you to speak your truth and voids any NDA, then you're no longer scared of the NDA to talk about stuff. So that's a contract that tries to get you to be quiet. It's really quite a lot like a, one of these unforgivable curses. It makes you not be able to talk about your truth, um, which to me is purely like literally devil <laughs> um, working right. its magic through contract. Yeah. The devil is in the details. Every time you see a celebrity doing one of these, oh, okay, yes, you know it's it's the silence is the it's the shroud, it's the collective, like agreed upon. You shush your mouth if you want, you know, you want the fame and accolades to keep rolling in. You better hush. I don't know if you've had this, but I've had people throw millions of dollars in my face to do something I didn't want to do, and what just. You've been off, yeah. Oh, they're in the room. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to. Yeah. That was my way of yes, cueing you. Like, it's open dialogue. Yeah, you want me to keep talking about by, it? By all means, let's, we can keep talking about anything. But. <laughs> but don't do it. Yeah, I just. I, it's, I, it's, no. It's tough, man. These cat. You guys saw Cat Williams. Not to, di not to divert us, but the Cat Williams interview. Yes, I did. I'm so proud of my Cat Williams. <laughs> I was going to say. Ticket sales got to be through the roof, though, because he's going on tour. So it's kind of like playing both sides a little bit. He's like, oh, you know. I infiltrate the Illuminati and see what secrets they got in there. And then I grab some and I run back to y'all and bring them to y'all. And, and, and they would kill me if they could. But I'm too fast. <laughs> and that for him. Yeah. And like these people, I really think these people are dead um, that he would be scared of. And I think some of these people know that there's no longer the type of Slytherins <laughs> in yeah. media and everyone that they used to be scared of. And I think this is why they might also be talking and it might not be so nefarious as we have been, you know, very obviously understandable, not trusting a lot of these truthers from Hollywood coming out. But I mean, Kat's always been talking this crazy stuff. The way you heard it first, right at the cusp of 2012. They are planning on leaving our motherfucking ass right here. They got space shittles lined up with GPS navigation. <laughs> no worries um i'm gonna go on with this because okay so we know that so far we've covered gryffindor they wanted to teach the smart and courageous the courageous um helga hufflepuff wanted to teach everybody and i do like the idea of teaching everybody because if these evil wizards have the power. I think everyone that they're around should have the knowledge of how to fight back personally. Um, but Salazar, he said only teach the pure, the pure blooded. Now, in real life, I understand what these royal families think they're chasing. They they think that they are the lost line of Jesus, basically. And 
that's what they think the Royals mean. But there's been so many um, stealing of the crowns that we don't really know if that bloodline that was the Royals is this, you know, Christ bloodline. And there's a lot of people within the Christ bloodline conspiracy that says he never had any kids and there wouldn't be any bloodline thereafter. And there's a lot of wars and a lot of money saying fighting for the opposite. And there's a lot of um, truth for that gunpowder plot that I did videos on before doing this Harry Potter plot. And it's explaining um, the takeover of the crown. And that's why we talked about Macbeth at the beginning of the series. The story of Macbeth is the rightful heir of the throne being um, left for dead and someone else taking over his spot. So the whole thing is trying to get the rightful and I say rightful, R-I-T-E, full, um, heirs back on the royal throne. And then you have people who are like, we shouldn't have any royalty whatsoever. And I understand everyone's under, like, I, I get the fight that everyone's kind of participating in when it comes to the royals. And I that's why I just can't see what Salazar was trying to only teach the pure because the bloodline he was trying to teach, it's only going to be okay for so long. And then everyone knows that uh, incest, you can, if you're trying to keep a bloodline pure, that means that 13 families are just having sex with each other and everyone is in their like cousins. Sorry, everyone is fornicating. <laughs> Damn. Yeah. And we have this, uh, the black family tree, explains uh that was in the last episode and they do explain how um technically the Malfoys are kind of distant relations of even the Weasleys because they are both pure blood families now there is one thing that I kind of sort of agree with Salazar Slytherin with and he was like okay teach the pure which I don't agree with but he also said the kids should at least know the three unforgivable curses by the time they leave Hogwarts. Now, the three unforgivable curses we covered really briefly with the fourth installment, and they are the ability to take someone over and use, utilize their body, the ability to kill someone instantly, and the ability to... What's the third one? Just torture. Yeah, torture. Yeah. Okay, so the torture and the ability to take someone over, I'm not a fan of those. However, here in America, we do have the Second Amendment. And the Second Amendment allows you to protect yourself at whatever cost. So technically, America, we wouldn't necessarily have Vada Kedavra, which is the killing curse, be an unforgivable curse. It's our Second Amendment, technically. <laughs> However, the other two, which is making someone a Manchurian candidate and torture, those are not very good. <laughs> well, yeah, this, yeah. One's, Go this ahead. one kicks off with death because they're killing within each other's families as well. Like the beginning of this film, it's Bellatrix again with her taunting i killed sirius black they cut to harry getting paparazzi in the ministry of magic and they're saying he's back is referring to the dark lord so it's very like very slithered very dark very you know the killing curse very curse heavy movie this one and they're trying to scare people that's all they have is fear that's all the devil has is fear as his influence marker and they right. start off really hard with last video we talked a lot about the fake news um coming into play and a lot of people didn't real or a lot of people didn't believe that voldemort came back and then after a year of being made fun of, everyone got proof that, yes, Voldemort did come back because everyone saw him at the ministry. And then did Harry get, oh, I'm sorry, probably not from everyone who made fun of him. And then they go from making fun of him, saying it's not true, to kind of like listening to all the Slytherins that take over um, the ministry. It gets bad. So, yes, and I did listen, re-listen to the book. And it is this book where they full out go for the muggles. It's not hiding anymore. Um, they are talking to the muggles in parliament. They are 
attacking muggles like the bridge scene is real um it's right. no longer just like the wizarding world it they're taking over everyone and um yeah it's it's one of my favorite scenes in the whole series because it's like a you know if it's a little bit like the matrix and the matrix movies where they show glimpses of like just the regular matrix and the people walking around the matrix but then like behind the veil there is this realness that the muggles are just completely oblivious to and that's really one of like the most intense points where you see the muggle world completely at the mercy of this entire race of beings that just know more than they do. They are just different. They have the knowledge, arguably that knowledge is the power. The knowledge is encoded in their, in their genetic, in their genome. And that's what makes them different. But the scene where they're all in this like matrix, like company, like office building mm -hmm. and they're, they're like sipping their coffee and they're just like, huh, that's weird. That's suspicious. Meanwhile, they're bleeding right through and, and they're, they're getting attacked. I actually thought it was a great scene. One of the it's most a beautiful scene. It's really scary. It really shows um, how close the evil ones that we are unaware of are in our reality. And I just, I just got done reading in another amazing child's book. That's where all the truth is. And it was called wizard for hire. And the wizard basically the entire book series, like he is explaining that your words are magic. Your actions are magic. Every little thing, if you do something and it becomes an outcome, like you just performed a craft, like, and right. of course the kids like, this isn't like Harry Potter. You're not going, you're not saying something and it's happening. He's like, I, I planned this so long ago. I've already done the spells like 10 years ago. They're just coming to fruition right now and you didn't see me cast the spells but it's happening so he that same wizard explains he goes oh you can always tell if dark magic's well not dark magic you can always tell if the wizards are in the muggle world if there's a really crazy storm or because it's these storm systems that are easily made and they will cover the sky. So if you need to have a sky war, you just put a cloud cover down, make it rain. No one will be outside and no one will be able to look up or see what's happening in the skies. If you have fighting going on, you just throw in thunder. It, it'll just people just think it's thunder and lightning. Um, you can make people like basically the most real magic that people can utilize is storms and muggles will never even second question a storm you guys know what this represents what well, i don't know the calm before the storm what's the storm could be the calm, the calm before the storm what storm is we have the world's great military people in this room i will tell you that and uh, we're Thank you all for coming. Thank you. A year, about a year ago, a little over a year ago, I talked about this visitation that I had, which was like an astral visitation. And these military personnel with insignia that I did not recognize told me, they gave me a whole bunch of information, but they said that there would be an increase in strange weather systems, partially for the purpose of shielding certain like I want to say they use the term quadrant, but I, that was then arguably it's broken up into four pieces, but they said that they're shielding human eyes from aerial combat. We, we can't see that. They don't want us to see that. So they were going to create, uh, you know, entire systems to block our view from it because it's simply a matter of like timing and decorum honestly the vibe i got was like no this is just our policy we don't allow you know we don't allow you guys to just wow you know what i mean they kind of have to like totally i get it and i think on uh we need to do a twilight series but on twilight they joke around during one of the weather storms of the muggles and they're like oh this is the only time we can play because we make a lot of noise so they also have to wait for a storm and they can do their activities but that's kind of how this um wizard was talking about oh like there's wizards around you all day like you guys would never even realize it mm -hmm. um and we have been having these crazy storms and i don't think it's just bad guys it's definitely a fight in 
the air, but we have to realize that the god Jupiter. How often do you think about the Roman Empire? A couple times a day, maybe. Wait, really? Yeah. Plants were just. I'm going to ask you again. How often do you think about the Roman Empire? At least two to three times a day. Bigger. How often do you think about the Roman Empire? Three times a day. Okay, so I fell down the uh, the straight men thinking about the Roman Empire rabbit hole. And Often equated with the Greek god Zeus, Jupiter is known for his authority, thunderbolts, and his role in shaping the destiny of Rome. He is typically depicted as a regal figure, holding a thunderbolt, and seated on a throne, symbolizing his dominion over the heavens. The Capitoline Hill in Rome was home to the Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus, one of the most important religious sites in ancient Rome. His story includes episodes like the overthrow of the Titans, his battle against the giants, and his role in the foundation of Rome, particularly the myth of Romulus and Remus. He was associated with the concept of divine protection and the well-being of the Roman state. Roman rulers often sought Jupiter's favor to legitimize their rule. Jupiter's legacy is seen in the enduring connection between divine authority, thunder, and rulership. This, if we're looking at these um, Greek myths, if we're talking about Harry Potter, then you do have to um, kind of understand Greek mythology, Norse mythology, Egyptian mythology, and understand that like this Jupiter influence is always going to be the god of storms and lightning. And it's just interesting that Trump owns a lot of property like jupiter florida look at trump jupiter florida and he did tell the world like a storm is coming and he had all these military guys with him and he's like the storm's coming like beware and no one knew what that meant and then we started having crazy storms all throughout the world the past since <laughs> There's a lighthouse in Jupiter, Florida, because I'm often in Jupiter, yeah. Florida, like maybe five or six times a year. I'm out there and there is a lighthouse that sits atop uh, what looks like the remnants of a period. Uh, I'm sorry, a pyramid, a period. Oh, um, a period. <laughs> Same. And it's uh, there's a historical structure that it's just very Jupiter, Florida is a very interesting place, actually. All of Florida is weird. I grew up yeah. in Boca Raton and like just the southern part, and my parents would take me to the Key West. And I was a young teen, like, I didn't want to be with my old fart parents at all, <laughs> so yeah. I didn't like take it in for everything it was worth on those summers. But Florida is very interesting. Well, Saint Augustine. You guys will have to come. We'll have to do a thing because yes. St. Augustine is my favorite city in Florida, and arguably my favorite city in America. And there's just so much history there. We should do a ghost tour and get like an Airbnb. And, like, yeah, let's do it. It's the oldest town in America. The Fountain of Youth is supposed to be there. Um, <laughs> weird, weird stuff. Very interesting. Love it. Let's do that it. Sounds awesome. All righty. So, um, Obviously, we talked a lot of shit about Slytherins already, and I do want people to know that we bring in a pretty cool Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher. Um, his name is Slughorn, and he's actually a really good Slytherin, and he, I think, shows this beautiful like ambition isn't bad and he definitely shows ambition he always wants to know who the most popular people are who's going to be you know well in society um which i think is wonderful for a teacher you should want your the kids you're teaching to go on and make great things i think that's great it's for a professor it's appropriate um and he does he really does risk his life because um every single day Death Eaters are coming to his door trying to recruit him. Mm -hmm. And he obviously is running away from them, but like he yeah. is spitting in the Death Eaters face going, no, I'm on Dumbledore's side. I'm going to be at the school. And yes, Hogwarts apparently, so they say, <laughs> is a very safe place. So um, that's why he goes to Hogwarts. Um, we And this is something I always forget because I've obviously watched the movies more than I've read the books. I've only read the books three times. Um, Harry won the Tri Wizard Cup when he was 14. He actually made like 10 or $20,000 for doing so. 
and he doesn't need the money because he's not Harry Potter's naturally really rich. And mm. people who haven't read the books don't realize Harry's rich because his family made this hair serum because Harry's hair is always like crazy. So his bloodline has crazy hair that doesn't like do what you want it to do. So someone in his family mm. made this hair serum that like if you have curly like Hermione uses it for the dance. Um no she has way. Yeah. Sure. So he's famous for like um hair <laughs> products. Yeah. So he doesn't need any money. He's still getting like this hair serum is still on the market. So he's not just like he's getting um, residuals. He's getting residuals. Yeah. He's constantly growing. <laughs> That's amazing. I love it. I love it. So cool. I really didn't know that. That's so cool. It's so cool. So he didn't need the money from the Triwizard Cup is like what I'm trying to get at um, because of his his wealth. So he gave those winnings to George and Fred so they could open a joke shop. Great. Um, I was wondering where that money came from. <laughs> yeah, like, this is very expensive property. <laughs> this real estate is insane. <laughs> but it was um it was kind of In like Portland times. where the liberals brought the land val value down so much so they probably got a good deal because when you when we see Hogsmeade and their little shop it's like the only business that's running. Everything else is shut down and I think mm -hmm. having a joke shop being so vibrant during such a dark time is so beautiful because yes, people want to laugh when, when right. hell is breaking loose, when world war three is at the door. The number one thing people want is cat Williams to do a stand up or to <laughs> Bo Burnham to come out with a little songs, making fun of everything because we do need yes. to just laugh at it. It's just hilarious. Well, the Death Eaters, yeah, did a number on Hogsmeade to kidnap kidnap the wand dude in the beginning, and then break up the bridge, and then they don't successfully kidnap Slughorn. But they, the one part about that scene that I never understood was the the dragon blood that was left behind when they were attempting to kidnap Slughorn yeah. in this random Muggle's house, and I was like, does Slughorn eat dragons? Like, what's going on? Okay, so that part is different than the book. So in the okay. book. Harry and Dumbledore show up to Slughorn, the, the house that Slughorn's staying at, and it's a mess inside. And he goes, Slughorn, I know you're here. And he goes, what gave me away? And he goes, you don't have a dark mark above the house. If you were actually taken, they would have put a dark mark, which is the, it's a really cool mark. I'm not going to lie, but it is the Death Eater's mark of a skull with a huge like serpent coming out of it. <laughs> um, it's horrible. It's, it's the bad guy. It means that you've been taken over. So it was actually the dark mark that the lack of one that gave Slughorn away in the books. Oh, I see. So there was no mention to dragon blood in the books for that one. Nope. Mm -mm. Hmm. No Fascinating. Yeah. Um, but he is a collector. He does just have things. Um, I know, a little yes. bit about blood you can't just like hold it because it oxidizes so i don't know how people would keep any kind of blood i don't really want to know that but like um <laughs> <laughs> that is interesting i guess well he was always poking around like he was uh he was ready to harvest something from uh, Aragog. He was like, hey, Hagrid, if you don't mind, I have a little collection thing here. I would like if he's not using it, you know, and then he's poking around like the, the botanist lady's place. And Harry's like, what are you doing? He's like, oh, oh, you know, I'm just true. You know, he's he's the epitome of a Slytherin and he's resourceful. And that's literally one of the traits of a Slytherin is they're resourceful. Like if they are not going to let a resource like that go to waste, they're like, Oh, I need to not cash in on it, but it's good to have kind of thing. He's a potions guy too. So he's like, I need this. This, yeah. is, this is for my craft. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that scene is, I probably do it at least once a week since the video, the movies have come out where Harry, goes like the snappers and he's on the fully the potion that allows yeah. you to have all this like yeah he he's does so the... cute there he is like he's really coming into his own it's like harry like, are, you, are you being funny like are you really 
telling jokes right now, young man? Oh, I know. You didn't grow at all, Harry, but at least you're funny. That'll come in later. No, the real Harry Potter is really tall, apparently. But of course, no. when you're casting oh. children, you don't know what height they're going to be. Daniel Radcliffe in real life, his baby mama is like a freaking head taller than him. And she's American. Wow. And she's a raging leftist oh. feminist. They're not even married. So he was really in real life. He was he uh, was taken over by just the propaganda and you know whatever. I did. I actually grew up. Uh, I I I know a few magic tricks and like some really good ones. Yeah. And I did one on my friend a while ago, and he was like, "How have I never seen you do these?" And I was like, "I don't go around doing fucking magic tricks for a very yeah. obvious reason." <laughs> I did. I actually grew. Up. Um. And that's interesting <laughs> in itself. He <laughs> would. I wish he would just go out, do it. Make all of our like do it for us. We want <laughs> that. Uh, how funny would that Him be? Him sticking around. Uh, we'll see how long he can last. That's magic on its own with his level of fame. I feel like sometimes. Yeah. Exactly. And it's same with Slughorn in a way too. In this series, like he's saying that he's a valuable asset, but he's the biggest asset I think of this whole film in a way because of his memory and the way he messed with his own memory and the way he potentially helped the most dangerous asset I would say in the whole series and I love how also they push towards the childhood of Tom Riddle and they give that background information with Dumbledore realizing that Tom is very powerful but in a way he's going to continue to teach him and instigate this unstable child. And that's like the biggest regret. And then this other teacher, this other Slytherin teacher has this huge regret have helping at all this, this child, yeah. this, what's the word? It's kind of like the antichrist. Like you accidentally yeah. catch yourself helping the antichrist. What kind of, what kind of intensity is that? And like, that's a lifelong karma that you're going to have to clear up and deal with and face head on. And I like that they tried to do this in this film, but, it's like the weakness of the elders, like they couldn't quite fully do it. They needed this youth to come in from a hair product lineage, you know, come in and help everybody out for some reason, which I love. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's a great, no, you said, okay, so that is, there's so many parallels to Star Wars and my husband and maybe your husband too, Alexis, are going to be talking about Star Wars. Star um, and Wars, yes. into that. But I mean, that is, again... Yoda said, we're not teaching this boy, Qui-Gon. He's too full of fear. We're yeah. not teaching him. And Qui-Gon's like, yeah, I'm going to do it. And then die so I don't have to deal with any of the repercussions. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, so that's kind of exactly what Slughorn and Dumbledore did is they taught the boy that had too much hate in his heart. And let's talk about Tom Riddle and this lack of love. So in okay. the... Okay, so we go to Hogsmeade and we see the twins joke shop for the first time. And they do have a love potion. Love potion comes up a couple times in this video, in this book. And the first time we see the love potion is like at the joke shop. But Voldemort, the whole reason there even is a Tom Riddle, he was the child of a woman who put a man on a love potion they did oh. not have real love it was not a love child it was a manchurian candidate like honeypot kind of situation um and she, this baby was not of love so that's why through like the next two mo books he's incapable of love and that is ultimately what brings voldemort down but it started off with a love potion yeah isn't that wild the that's mother such an important point <laughs> The so Voldemort's <laughs> biological mother was a witch and she was spying because this whole background story really like made everything click for me. I was like, oh, that's why he's an evil that I get it. The mother put a spell on a muggle man who was like tall, strapping, gorgeous. She knew she never like had a chance with him because apparently she was very homely. She was sickly. She had a terrible relationship. Like she was abused by her father. So this was a broken witch. And she put a spell on this guy, um, a muggle man. So Voldemort has a muggle father. So there's the hate. And then I guess he realized, like, I, I can't remember if he realized or if the spell was somehow. Over, but he abandoned the uh, Voldemort and the mother. And then Voldemort's mother, 
she just died. Like she, she died. She literally gave up, like she gave up on everything and the magic just dried up and she died like out of, like she gave up. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense because he was full of hate for the muggle world because he is half, he's a half blood first of all. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and then his poor mother just didn't even have the heart to live for him. So he never knew anybody's love and in that i understand him like i i get it voldy i get it he needs healing and that's why whenever we deal with magic the very very first thing is all right let's start healing and that's why there's so much fake news in the healing community itself and all the fake stuff gets really popular because it has money and it's not censored so the whole thing is they don't want us to be healed of our past trauma because that's one way to influence how we use our magic is if you're tra traumatized if you have mommy and daddy issues you're not going to be able to do magic um and you can you just make a huge mess it's more important. you're going to be uh sold out to the dark lords so, and I just want to say, cause I'm the year of the snake and I posted about this before and you reached out and you were like, are you catching flack? And I'm like, no, no, it's just an observation. Um, you know, 1989 year of the snake snake, gets a really bad reputation, yeah. but if I wasn't the year of the snake. I wouldn't have found myself in certain situations at certain times because what's, what does a snake do? The snake is small. The snake can get into small spaces and is very cunning, thinks about these things, but also very lucky. Snakes are lucky. And so I, like throughout the co course of my life, I have been in positions where I'm like, how did I get here? Like, how is this possible? It's, it's, the, it's the snake, it's the Slytherin. Mm -hmm. And Slughorn is probably one of my favorite characters because he embodies both like all these traits where he has the ambition. He is pretty cunning. Like he wants to know, like you said, he wants to know who's the most promising. He wants to collect these people because he's he likes the power. He it's alluring. It's it's sensuous too. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, he's like, I'm not, I'm not with that. Like I'm you know, I'm 50, 50 over here. Can't, can't drink the Kool-Aid. So we love Slughorn for that. He's a testament to the fact that not all Slytherins, not all Slytherins choose the dark side for good, you know, forever. Other. And totally. not all dinner parties with underage wizards are creepy. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, that's so sweet. Just, it's true. Just a few of them. Just a few um, of them like remain wholesome, but. Okay, no, let's talk about that. So uh, if you take the father out of the household, if you break up the nuclear unit, you are not, you're going to have children who don't understand what masculinity is. They're not going to understand respect. They're, there's a lot of yeah. stuff that I know Instagram is always like, down with the patriarchy. First of all, I can trace everything and every problem back to a woman. So knock it the fuck off with the patriarchy. <laughs> Two, um, it's actually the patriarchy that if if we had a strong patriarchy, none of this would be happening. World War Three would not be as close as it is, and it is this manly influence that our society needs. All Mike, the wives, Stepford, this this was all your idea? Yes. All I wanted was a better world. A world where men were men and women were cherished and lovely. Does anyone have a screwdriver? The perfect world. But you were married to a robot. The perfect man. And all I wanted was to make you, all of you, into perfect women. 
We don't need to be perfect. How could you do this to us? Because I was just like you. Overstressed, overbooked, underloved. I was the world's foremost brain surgeon and genetic engineer. I had top secret contracts with the Pentagon, Apple, and Mattel. Come on. Don't you worry. I'm going to talk to him. My dad is so stubborn. What he says goes. You know, the man is the head of the house. Let me tell you something, Tula. The man is the head, but the woman is the neck. And she can turn the head any way she wants. Hmm? Also, if we're going to get really into it, a society shouldn't be more than about 500 people. And they've done a bunch of tests. A bunch of science has proven that if you have a society over 500 people, the masculine will die because you that's about the right amount of men that uh, their territory, like men are territorial. So that's as much territory that humans can like stand and then when you overdo that 500 you have people slavery no matter what slavery comes in some way shape or form low wages for a lot of work starts to creep in and this beta male really toxic masculinity starts to come into play um so first of all we should be having these tiny hamlets or small towns around with just less than 500 people and um that's something i wanted to say but because of that um i think we would have if we did have these small hamlets small little towns we would be able to have a healthy men's club almost where it's men meeting up like they do with slughorn and talking learning each other's crafts um talking about feelings and just getting stuff out which i do think is needed um but it's not like that in our world there's too much competition so things get weird real quick when competition starts going up exactly um okay so we start off the school year um malfoy has been spotted going into a scary place when the kids were getting their school supplies borgen and burks and um in the books harry actually overhears uh malfoy saying yes i'm being this is an initiation into one of the bad (laughs) secret guy societies (laughs) that we don't like and his initiation is going to be learning how to use a vanishing cabinet, which is an ancient piece of magic that they don't really use anymore, but it's still helpful to get in and out of places. So if you have two vanishing cabinets, one here, one in the school, then you will be able to transport people into the school. It's like a, it's a way in, it's a port key almost, and you can leave the school um, through this kind of portal technology magic, um, he starts utilizing it. He Malfoy himself. I I really do love Malfoy. I'm sorry. I feel for Malfoy the same way that Jenny was feeling for Slughorn. Um, Malfoy was given a really really crappy hand. Malfoy is different than Slughorn or it, than Voldemort. Because Malfoy is capable of love. And that is one thing that we cannot say Malfoy doesn't have. Because his family, like, he loves his parents. Um, He looks up to his parents. He is a mama's boy. That's why he's always saying, like, wait till I tell my father about this. No one else in school is thinking about their parents. But Malfoy (laughs) always is. Yeah, yeah. Um, love the crap out of him too. He grew up love, absolutely cherished yes. by his family, by his mother. So, yes. Um, and Malfoy, he sees Voldemort. Voldemort comes to the Malfoy house. He takes over their house. So wow. the love that they really don't show in the movies. Um, the love that Malfoy has for his family makes him hate Voldemort so much. Um, he does not, he's not a fan of Voldemort because he sees the behind the scenes of what Voldemort is doing to Malfoy. And I think we do see Lucius going from a gorgeous man to ratchet over just a 18 month time frame, mm-hmm. and the amount of terror that the Malfoy family has to deal with starting now in the series. It, 
my heart goes out for them. And ultimately, Malfoy does turn into a muggle sympathizer, and he no longer has this prejudice by the end of the series for muggles. And he, him and his wife are happy with muggles, but like, um, it takes a lot to get there. And it is because Malfoy does experience love. Um, we start the school. Harry was thrown into Slughorn's class, so he didn't have his books already. Him and Ron were given books, even though the movie has a much cuter scene of how they got the books. Um, they were given books, and the book that Harry was given had all of these like writings and notes on every page. And at first, he's like, oh, great, I have an old book. Like This is stupid. But he starts realizing that these notes on every single potion are coming out with different results than everyone else. And someone almost made each and every potion stronger and better. Um, and inside the book, it says it belongs to the half blood prince and no one knows who the half blood prince is. But during all of this, we're mm -hmm. learning that Voldemort was half blood. Like um, Jenny said, so you're kind of thinking like, Oh my God, is this like Voldemort's book? Like that's kind of scary. Cause it's taking over Harry. <laughs> Hitler was the same. Wasn't Hitler the same? He hated Jews, but he was like part Jew. Yeah. That says self-hate, man. If you can't accept mm -hmm. yourself, you're going to project it into the world and start and killing Lily, it. Right. And <laughs> Lily was also muggle-born, too. So that they mentioned that as well. Like Slughorn's like, oh, I love muggle-born witches and wizards or whatever. <laughs> yeah, Slughorn is not racist. He makes that very clear, which is wonderful to hear. Um, okay, so we start to, <sighs> Dumbledore is on missions. He's gone a lot. His hand is all messed up. You're slowly understanding how Tom Riddle was raised in the background of all these memories and stuff and dreams. And uh, we learned that Tom Riddle, he, he found a way to play a really long game. He knew that you couldn't just take over the world because you're going to be shot down. He knew that you had to fractalize yourself so that if one plan fails, you have plan B. If that plan fails, you have plan C. And that's how you take over the world. And we go into the last video we covered. We started off with the Osiris resurrection um, and low level in real life, when people learn about occult and stuff, one of the very low level things that you tell low level Gnostics is, oh, it's all the Osiris story. So basically like uh, Jesus is Osiris and it doesn't matter anything. And like, you should just get over it. It's all the same story. When in reality, I have been in the darkest corners of all of these different <laughs> modalities so the people who are watching this is what they learn this is what you learn when you like watch zeitgeist and stuff and people think they know everything yeah, yeah, because right. they yeah. watch this they're like so um don't listen to translations translations which i i agree the bible has been translated basically from hebrew to greek back to like it's been it's not the best translation however what they're saying is that Lucifer is Jesus, which if you know the story of the Bible, no, Lucifer is Archangel Michael in the fifth or sixth dimensional field. They had to drop down to a polar society, a third dimensional realm. So that being had to split into two and everyone knows that lucifer is the double half or the second half of archangel michael not has nothing to do with jesus so when you're with these low-level masons they always try and tell you jesus is actually satan and um it's all osiris so you should just like worship osiris and that's where it always goes really quickly and it's very uncensored but there's more way more to the story and Jesus knew that you had, he knew yeah. the, he knew the game. He knew that you had a sacrifice. He knew that there was a resurrection aspect, but he knew a different way, which is God's way. And he did it slightly differently. And that actually goes into what we're talking about. God 
has a way of resurrecting people, and it's called DNA. DNA holds memories. We know this scientifically. We know that genes are passed through DNA. We even know that memories are stored in DNA. This is a uh, proof when people get um, trans, like if you lose a heart and you need someone else's heart, people ha can like speak other languages after they get someone's blood transfusion or these organ transplants. They speak different languages. They have cravings for things that they've never tried before. And it's a, it's your body reading this new DNA, which has its own likes and memories attached to it. So, uh, yeah, DNA holds memory. And if you can access your DNA, that is the most realistic way of resurrecting. And it is our God given blood. <laughs> do, do you guys have anything to say with that? Or can I, we go into the pensive? I have a lot. Um, yeah, I'm it. right now, um, I mean, you know, I, I love how they had the, the bowl, you know, where it's like a, cause we have that in the occult, you know, you, it's called scrying. You just use a reflective surface and allow your intuition to guide you. Um, but I do love the role that water took in these films, just because, you know, from the tears, the salt water from, I know that's, that's later down the line, but the idea that the memory uh, stored in his tears was, you know, then unfolded an entire story that we, the viewer, didn't know entirely yet. Um, but yeah, certainly, I mean, I, I'm convinced that, you know, if we had the technology, like I imagine a sort of technology, like a, if you see like the way a magnet can draw other, you know, sort of other metals, responsive metals out from a, a mass, I see something similar happening where we're able to wave some kind of technology over the physical vessel and specific memories that we're keyed into specifically looking for are then vibrated like they're it's like a matching game it's like an energetic matching game and they're sort of brought to the surface um and you know potentially we're able to sort of stream those and and enjoy those or learn from those things right so it's kind of like a real life version of this um what's it called what it, what do they call this when he dips his head in is it the pencil okay, that's what it is that's right that's what it is yeah um and to me it looks a lot like mercury it's like a liquid silver which i think mm -hmm. is interesting because mercury it goes hand in hand with being hermes it's very interesting that this liquid silverly substance which is in all of our phones which is in all of our if you are looking at a screen right now mercury is being utilized to mercury. light up the screen so like when i tell people like we are using magic you're just used to it like this is what i mean and it is a looking glass yes and i think it's interesting too i know we might get to it in a few more slides but what jenny was mentioning with the tears and how there was a matching game of the frequencies and these memories, but also when you were mentioning the DNA, Alexia, it made me think like, in a way, the beauty of the story or how Snape eventually also passes in his agony, but he still is able to translate his true love and his memory to the DNA of Lily through this process, which is this magical, you know, this reading glass or whatever that you can read these tears you can read this water you can read dna and these memories with and i just it didn't hit me the same way until you mentioned it both of you so thank you for kind of like weaving that because it is very romantic in a way but also again that tragic like you know yeah. unrequited <laughs> silly crazy <laughs> romance that is only relatable in fiction but <laughs> right um, uh, and the real cute. truth behind water, and of course, this is one of the first things that everyone in the occult knows, and it's a real life study, but made by Dr. Emoto, and he spoke to water, just words, he sp spelled, Amer you know, he spoke words to water and froze it instantly, and then he looked at the water, and when he said words of compassion, 
thank you, gratitude, wisdom, when he spoke truth, when he spoke joy, when he spoke love, the water was gorgeous, was just beautiful, intricate, very harmonious. And what's the word? Uh, symmetrical, um, mm -hmm. little frost. And then he started speaking words of hate to the water and he froze the, so mean. the mean words and he froze the bad stuff. And those fractals were disgusting. They didn't even look like snowflakes. So he said, you make me sick. He said evil stuff. He had polluted water before praying over it. Um, and he had the same polluted water after prayer and the prayer even transformed the nasty bad water the words of sickness made the water freeze not even looking like it was horrible so you are at least 75 percent water your words really do structure your reality i know there's going to be a million people trying to sell you things to structure water i myself love liquid mana it's amazing it's structured water but uh, your words can structure water and that is your power that you ha each and every one of us has. So I hate, I hate when people talk, what is it called? The self-deprecating humor? <laughs> you help, you hate self-deprecation. I, I hate self-deprecation. And <laughs> that's going to be quite the snowflake, that sentence right there. <laughs> I know. It's, it's making that water of self-deprecation turn ugly in me, but um, it's, the only true curse that everyone does on a daily basis. It is my least favorite curse. <laughs> or when so people are talking, ab talking about their food or what they do or don't want to eat or should and shouldn't eat, even speaking any sort of crap in the kitchen at all, it just makes me so triggered. I'm just like, stay away from the food with that. Like, do not. <laughs> I've oh always been my. like that, like kitchen sacred space. You say nice things here and nice things to the food. Like that's all you can, you're all only allowed to do that. I think People are vicious in their food. I think I told you like when I'm in a really shitty mood and I'm just <laughs> miserable, I, I mean, not every time because man, those moods, you know, they come, but uh, I'll force myself to like make soup because we're going to eat it. You know what I mean? Like if I'm going to cook it, we're eating it. I'm not going to feed anybody something that I have now programmed with my despair and negativity. So it forces you there to like, you know, you're peeling, you're chopping, you're standing there, you're mixing, you're doing all of this stuff. It forces you, even if you have to fake it. I, and I do very often fake it. I'm happy. Everything's fine. I'm happy. Everything's fine. Like, you know, just repetition. Keep <laughs> So whether it's subliminal, whether it's out loud, it doesn't matter. The The food, the water molecules in the food don't seem to be able to tell the difference when you're kind of like forcing yourself, you know what I mean? And, but my intention, our intention is to really like reprogram it. So I'm not like being fraudulent, you know, I'm <laughs> trying to heal myself. I'm trying to fix the, the problem. So that is something I recommend Anybody that is in a, a, a bit of a dark cloud type of energy mentally, psychologically, if it's if it's manageable and you can still function, go ahead and like get in the kitchen and make something that takes a little bit of time because it does take some time to kind of kind of trick your mind into, you know, thinking that you're happy, you're okay, you're calm, but it really does help because then you're going to eat that. You're going to share that with people. And, um, it's, it's just, it's always worked for me. That's wonderful. And I kind of do, I didn't know how I did that. So that was cool. Hi. Okay, um, ladies, I, wanted, <laughs> I wanted to share and I didn't know when I would be able to bring this up, but my biggest manifestation to date um, and it's funny that it happened on my 33rd year, but it was my house just becoming a homeowner, which for many millennials, that's something that is not as easy as our parents Pipe and grandparents dream. generation. Pipe dream. <laughs> Pipe dream. Um, and it really was because solely because of the veterans, uh, VA loan. So if my husband wasn't in the military, we wouldn't have been able to do it. So, um, we were able to buy a house, but this is the crazy thing. Like I on my, when I'm just bored and doing stuff, like when I'm just bored and if I could 
do whatever I want to do. I will make four floor plans. I have probably made millions. I'm not joking. I have probably made I wasn't over 500,000. What? I was not expecting you to say floor plans. I was like, <laughs> I don't know what this could be. No, like I, it's what I do. I just zone out and I make floor plans. Um, that's amazing. And I oh, have oh done my it. God. It looks like a real, like, that's my backyard, what it's going to look like. Yeah. I just, I have made, <laughs> I'm not joking, birds, tens to hundreds of thousands of floor plans. Wow. And I have some features that are in the floor plans over and over again, just things I like. And it was very important for me not to move into a house that had an open kitchen to living room. Because like, yeah, what you're watching on TV is now in the kitchen. And if you're making food, now those two shared spaces, it's it's a whole thing. So um, I had all of, the, I have been for just 20 years making my dream house. And we moved into this house. It had like every single day I realized, oh my God, I drew that like thousands of times. Mm -hmm. And it came true in this house. And it's very hard in Arizona, like we don't have old houses. It's not an old state. Everything's like stucco and made in the past 20 years. Yeah. And I did get an older house just randomly that um, it doesn't have, it has its own kitchen and its own living room, totally separated. And it really makes you become mindful of being in the kitchen because you're, you're not able to just watch the TV and cut vegetables. Like you have to be present and stuff. So I love that. And just like so many random things in my house. I'm like, I drew that so many times and I have it here. So um, even down to, I always told my husband, I'm like, we will have a house where you can see fireworks. I'm not going to be walking or driving to fireworks shows. And 4th of July and New Year's, I can see three huge fireworks shows from our front like window. It's awesome. So speaking of fireworks, when we go to watch this back, Alexis, you, I don't know if those are, if you it's a fly, it's a fly. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cause I'm like, I keep seeing something zoom, but it's lit up because the camera is just putting light on it. So I'm like, Oh my God, it's an orb. Oh my God, it's another one. Oh, it's a fly. <laughs> it's my little uh, homie. It, it, they love me here. I think it is because when whipping up such good stuff in the kitchen, I mean, yeah. I mean, it's funny too, because even the potions, like if you make them right, to this extremes, like liquid luck, you can make that. You can make, what did they call the, they called it, bear, there was Varus serum, mm -hmm. there was Amortentia, or Amortentia, which was the love potion. Uh, <laughs> I was calling it love potion number nine. <laughs> Yeah, and like uh, the living death as well. Like I thought that was crazy that he was What's having the living death. Living, the living death. Like that was the contest that in the Slughorn's classroom. Like oh. please make the living death, and he opens the Half Blood Prince wow. textbook, and he's like, "Great, makes it wins," That's and really cool. uh, gets gets the Liquid Luck prize. So the, the opposite. Can we make that at home. <laughs> The opposite is absolutely true. Many years ago in another life, this life, but feels like another life, <laughs> I, was, I was in a, an extremely like violent, abusive, toxic, domestic relationship. And I was pregnant and I was, it was violent. It was, it was really bad. Um, and, but I was naive. So I'm thinking I could fix it. I can make it work. You know, so I'm in the kitchen and my partner at the time is drunk and I'm full of fear, full of fear in my body. Every cell of my body is terrified and I'm cooking dinner because if I don't, I'm going to get in trouble. So I'm cooking dinner. I have made that recipe a hundred times at that point. Everything was the same. Everything was the same. I got the basil, I got the sauce. Got, and, but because he was almost like this predator moving around the home and every time he would come close, I would get scared. I would get tense. Just keep, just cook. Just, do. but when I tell you, I made that recipe a million times. I tasted it afterwards and I spit it out. It like, it was just the most disgusting. It tasted like, like pain. It tasted like something you just do not want to consume. And everything was fresh, same recipe. Didn't, it didn't do, it was like my, um, my, almost like a type of, like when you're scared, you just, I don't know. So for me, I guess the cope was like, just focus. Don't, 
you know, just stay survival, you know what I mean? Just survival type of thing. But my fear was like, absolutely. It completely leaked in to every molecule of every ingredient that I was using. And it went in the trash. He said it, he was like, this is disgusting. Throw it away. And I did. And I threw him away too, in the end. (laughs) I'm so proud of you. That was like a thousand years. I might've been uh, 20, 21 years old. So what do we know at that age, right? Oh, I know. We think we know everything though. Oh God. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I wish I was as smart now as I was when I was 18. I knew everything. <laughs> <laughs> Joking. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, no, that was just uh, really interesting. What else did I want to show you guys? I don't know how this works. <laughs> Okay, so water memory, DNA memory, pensive. We are able to see other people's memories if we look at their liquids. <laughs> um, and this is something that will come up really heavy in the next video, but I did we did get a quick preview of the pensives. That's why we're talking so much about like Tom uh, riddle and hit like all these past memories is because of this pensive. So the whole reason that Dumbledore even brought this Professor Slughorn back was because apparently he Dumbledore had a corrupted memory. So he needed Harry to be a spy and retrieve this information, the correct non-corrupt memory from Slughorn. And the reason they're doing this is because Dumbledore is um trying to find horcruxes and he is trying to see what who the person who taught tom riddle about horcruxes which is splitting your soul up into a bunch of fragments of yourself and you have to do this by killing someone and that's one fragmented part of your soul you do it again that's another fragmented part of your soul and um he needed to find out how Voldemort was doing this because in order to kill Voldemort and stop everything permanently, we need to figure out how Voldemort is utilizing Horcruxes. So that's why we start learning this. Um, While Harry is trying to gather this information, get on the good side with Slughorn, Drago is like doing his own things using the room of requirement to um, learn how to use these vanishing cabinets to get bad people onto Hogwarts grounds at the end of the school year. And um, Harry is kind of aware that he's now a Death Eater and working for Voldemort. So like Harry does, they get into a really bad fight actually um, with just like the sneaking around. Um, Dumbledore has a terminal curse. He's about to die anyway. So he is on a limited time frame trying to get all these horcruxes and he does bring harry along with him to retrieve one horcrux that he thinks he knows where it is and he has to drink um do i even go okay basically he has to drink that stuff it's water i don't know what it is it's a bad spell that you have to like drink fully and it makes you be terrorized and you don't want to drink it all no look watching that scene ever since i got sick a few months ago i'm like i know everything he's feeling he's feeling doom hopelessness pain guilt shame turmoil like reliving everything he's ever said and done to anybody else like i know this is just me like totally making shit up right here but like i have a newfound love appreciation for that scene because whatever it is he's consuming he's like this may make me go mad this make me may make me want to end myself he's like you have to make sure i drink it all that scene i don't know i can taste it while he's drinking it i i just feel like i know what it tastes like i it was a song that i made when i was in terror at 21 years old that's what it fucking tasted like it's yes. true there we talk about that scene over on Ricky Leaks my telegram chat a lot because when you're doing chlorine dioxide and you're cleansing by day 4 or 5 you don't want to keep going and it automatically churns a different flavor because when you drink things that kill bugs the bugs are 
releasing toxins to let all the other bugs know in your body that you're drinking the poison for them and they start releasing ammonia. So it, this doesn't happen. It doesn't even happen your first time. People tell me it happens their second time doing chlorine dioxide. Your second month is the hardest month because you killed so many your first month. And then the second month, the bugs know what you're drinking and they start freaking out. So um, we always send each other like the Dumbledore drinking like, oh, you have to do it. Just keep drinking the chlorine dioxide. You have to keep doing it. You're like, I don't want to. And that's how it feels. And you really do have to push through it that second and third month. And then it goes away and you've killed most of the bugs and it doesn't taste like too bad afterwards. But oh my God. Yes. I was having that cup, that exact experience today. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Very, very real. Um, so that's why Dumbledore's hand is all messed up. He tried breaking a Horcrux and it's hard to, you, you can't like, you can't just easily break one of these Horcruxes um, unless you have a certain spell or a certain type of tool to do so. So we'll get more into that in the next video. Um, but something huge that happened is Malfoy's mother, Narcissa and Malfoy's aunt Bellatrix Narcissa. went to Snape and said, I need you to do an unbreakable vow. If Balfoy can't kill Dumbledore, which we know he can't, he's a kid, you need to kill Dumbledore. So then Snape, he has to pretend that he's in good graces with the Voldemort's team and the Dark Arts. So he's a triple agent. Like Snape, no matter what, is a triple agent. He's the best triple agent in literature, if you ask me. But um, he has to prove himself and... This is how he's going to prove himself to the Dark Arts and the Dark Lord and the Death Eater is like, okay, yep, I'm on your team. But realistically, no one realizes Dumbledore is dying anyway. So um, it's it's kind of a false flag for the good guys. It makes sense. Yeah. 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 I mean, it was pretty smart. It was real clever. Yeah. yeah. Against uh, Slytherins, which... Snape is a Slytherin. He, they are cunning. They are clever. They are resourceful. They can hit two birds with one stone. And I always thought uh, it was interesting. Like one of my favorite scenes mm -hmm. is when Snape, knowing what's happening, comes up behind Harry as Harry has his, his wand drawn on the situation. Snape comes up behind him and he's like, Right. The like, and he should have known, right, like Harry should have known right then, like, oh, there's some double agent, triple agent shit going on right now. I mean, you know, obviously he's a kid, but um, honestly, I, it. I love Snape so much for everything that he did. He was hot too. Like growing up is maturing is like when you, you know, you become an adult, you're like, damn, like Snape looked good. But when you're a kid, you're like, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, no, Alan Rickman's legendary, and it all the no Harry Potter has gorgeous people. I love it. Um, and it's so funny watching any BBC movie because like you're literally just going, Oh, hey, it's the Harry Potter cast doing yep. and John Jane Austen now. It's just hilarious. <laughs> Jane Austen, yeah. <laughs> um and yes so snape there was a meme i saw and i was so mad we didn't put it in the last video but i saw it like the day after and it's like these are two of these are two teachers that hate harry potter but there's a difference and the first one is snape standing in front of um the kids harry ron and hermione and he's blocking them because he thinks that um the people the rightfully so warm tail padfoot and prongs he thinks they're bad so he's trying to still save the children and he still uses his body as a block between yeah. the you know pretend potential danger and the kids and then you have umbridge and she has the kids in front of her and she's behind them using them as a shield so it's like even if we don't like people, you can still save them. And there is still love, even if you don't like someone. But then there's just pure hatred. So I really liked that little meme. So yes. right. 
Mm -hmm. Um, okay. So I always just want to say how Shakespeare, how this is lining up with Shakespeare. And it's so interesting that it's like, why are Dr. Beatrice Groves fellow and Shakespeare tutor at Trinity college and Oxford university? Why are these very well degreed people speaking about just Harry Potter? Like, Oh, they're going to spend so much of their time delving into how Harry Potter and Shakespeare are telling true stories or very, very real human condition like stories, basically. Um, and with this, we really do have kind of a Julius Caesar Judas moment because, oh, like, you're going to do me wrong? Like, it's a play on the Judas Last Supper thou that thou does does quickly and Macbeth says if it were done when it's done then twere well it will be done quickly so we have this same story going on with the Malfoy because Dumbledore looks at Malfoy right before he knows that Malfoy has to kill him when they're at the final battle and he goes oh really like get on you must do it go on do it Malfoy and this is what Macbeth this is how the same story happened. Like, okay, just do it. Like, kill me. And he doesn't. And then he looks at Snape and says, you know, please, like, just do it. Mm -hmm. um, and that is very reminiscent of both Macbeth and this Shakespeare story. Severus, please. Wow. Powerful, potent moment. So interesting. <laughs> Um, again, I always just want to say, like, how does it tie back to vampires? Because J.K. Rowling never outwardly says we're, we're dealing with vampires, um, except for if you know, you know, kind of things. And <laughs> when we did our very, very first video, this came out. And I remember uh, Tyler posted it. And it's basically Ty uh, Taylor Swift said in a magazine, I'm collecting Horcruxes. I'm collecting Infinity Stones. Gandalf's voice is in my head every time I put out a new one, which is interesting because Gandalf, even if he's not on your side, he's still reading the situation because Gandalf himself and me and my husband did a Lord of the Rings talk like this. Gandalf has, uh, well, the bad guys have planet tears. And for a quick moment, Gandalf does have one of the planet tears, which is being able, it's a scene stone. You can see what's going on in other people's. Uh, realities and that's really interesting that taylor swift is talking about this so again real life vampires are dealing with what we're talking about yeah it's almost like i could see how someone that didn't have very powerful discernment could be like oh wow taylor swift you know she's she is channeling the voice of gandalf you know that must make her did you say gandalf yeah, I did. She is trying to pretend to be a good one, but no, Gandalf would say that to a bad guy too. No, you know what I mean? Like you mean, you mean Sauron? Like you mean the bad guys, right? Because she, she ain't, she ain't a good witch. I'll tell you right now, mm -mm. she is not a good witch at all. She's no one girl. understands what's going on with that because it's not like she's a brand new pop artist, but she did for some reason get really famous again. 10 years into her craft. And it's like, yeah, she was famous. She's always been famous. But the weirdness, like Swifty love, that's only this past year, which well, means we, they're doing some it's magic. It's election year. It's it's campaign. It's it's the demographic that she is now literally hypnotized. She's she's their perfect uh vessel for for that sort of the conduit of that kind of energy. So we'll and I have a Swifty. Like my child like every song, every album, she's, she's working on a collage of all 12 album covers that she's re she's drawing them herself. I can't be like, no, you know, like <laughs> I try, I tell her a little bit. I'm like, listen, you know, she, I know she has great marketing and, and the, the music is nice and it's fun. I'm like, but just, you know, protect your heart, you know, protect your energy. I'm like, she's the devil. Basically. <laughs> Don't idol anyone. Don't idol anyone. That's all I got. Exactly. And it's funny because I was also 16 and we had that cute little love song and I listened to it all the time. There were definitely a couple of Taylor Swift songs I liked, but this like craze, that's not 
match. We go for Britney Spears. Like Britney Spears, the Spice yeah. Girl, Christina yeah. Aguilera, the Mickey Mouse Club basically was our yeah. uh, MKUltra. You know, <laughs> MK Ultra, right, exactly. They just kind of like repackaged it for like a new a whole new wave of of young girls and, and boys, but yeah. That's wild. Yeah. <sighs> so um Alexis, you had a better recollection of all the stuff that we did learn this year, which was a lot of different potions and stuff. We learned what pensives are. It's memories of Adi Kodava is obviously the killing spell. It's Thanks. I see this more as like a technology almost, but obviously it's magic. Uh, the vanishing cabinet that Malfoy's using, the love potion, uh, Felicis Felix, which is the luck potion, and the unstoppable death. Is that the other one? I'll just one other point too. I thought it was super lazy to use a vanishing cabinet. Like after they did the Bogart scene with like that other closet cabinet thing. And I was like, this is the same kind of, you know, object. They should have played with something else. In my opinion, I was like, that was kind of a lazy jump in my opinion, but they did learn other things. They apparated for the first time with Dumbledore and Harry. Cause he like scoops up Harry yes. right before he's like hitting on some lady in a British uh, uh, underground rail air restaurant or whatever so they operate for the first time apparently he doesn't puke so it's good and what else did they write I have we see they malfoy uses petrificus totalis on harry when he's trying to eavesdrop on malfoy in the train ride to their sixth year of school and luna finds him with the glasses those special glasses that you had and she talks about rack spurts and she's giving out the quibbler that also explains these other weird mystical creatures and all this other stuff she can see with these glasses in her particular personality. She uses the spell Episky on his nose that Malfoy breaks oh. after he gives him the totala. He basically paralyzes him. Harry falls to the ground. He kicks him in the face, breaks his nose, covers him with his, uh, you cloak. know, invisibility cloak and hopes that he goes back to London instead of to school, but Luna finds him, fix him up. They go to the school, pretend like nothing's wrong. Snape is there like covering for Malfoy, like before he even enters, like basically approving all this stuff without getting the auras to look over it. And so Malfoy gets to go in with all of his cursed items and whatever he's bringing to kill Dumbledore off. And those items like show up throughout the film, like the cursed necklace that he tried to give, like give to a student to give to Dumbledore and, uh, what else do we have on here that they learned? They learned, yeah, the Varus serum, polyjuice, the love potion, the Amarantia, the, which the Felix Felicis, the living death. Then in the book, the Half-Blood Prince book, Snape actually writes Septum Sempra, a spell that he makes up. And we never got to the point here in this film that the Half-Blood Prince is actually Snape. And his it's his chemistry textbook which is why he's so good at potions but mm -hmm. it was a part of the reveal but it was just a little part was this one little spell that he also made up which i don't know if they ever really he only uses it on snape and snape's like you can't use my own spell on me what are you doing like how do you even learn okay that? back up so when harry and malfoy get into the fight um what Ma harry does one of these spells from the half blood prince's book okay he does this crazy spell and it's bad it makes malfoy start bleeding out like almost oh, yeah. die bleeding out that's so right. obviously that's when snape knew that harry had his book because he made up this yeah. spell to He's make like, people bleed out. So he knew back then that, okay, Harry has my textbook. He knows my stuff. This whole time as the reader, you're kind of like, oh my God, does Harry have Voldemort's textbook? Um, and we realize no, it's Snape right after he kills Dumbledore. Like he's running away from Harry. He's not attacking Harry. That's a very big point. He's just deflecting all the spells Harry's casting at him because Harry's mad. Obviously, he just saw him murder, but he doesn't understand what's going on. And Snape tells him then, yes, are you, don't be stupid. You're using my spells. Don't use them against me. Um, but the first time we see it is when Harry used one of them against Malfoy and it was really really bad um also on the book it was Tonks who found Harry on the train um 
because the entire order oh. is watching the kids very, very closely. It wasn't okay. Luna that found him. Um, it was Tonks, but I think the movie did it better because um, I just love Luna and she's such a cutie pie. And uh, she is a, in this one a lot more. The last two, we really do see Luna and Neville and a couple other students like really get close to us, um, which is good because we are still making a army. It is still of allegiance. It is still a war growing. So um, we are grabbing people with, you know, the mission in mind this entire time. It is funny too, because with this particular, with this particular year, it seems like every single one of the three main characters has some sort of new love interest opportunity and love interest like conflict. So they're having like, emotional turmoil about their own i would say their own like first initial feelings of like wanting to pair up and be like an adult and like start pairing up and having love and whatever and that kind of comes in amongst all of this and the sorting hat is like telling them to be brave and strong in these troubling times and they're trying to do quidditch and <laughs> they're trying to do all these like normal things and have crushes and whatever, but they're still like, they're still just active plots to try and kill their headmaster and like this underground army, like keeping them alive. And uh, I don't know, it just, it speeds up really fast at the end too, where you think everything's chill and they're having decent school time. And then Horcruxes just kind of like enter in really like abruptly and then realize Dumbledore is dying really abruptly. And then like, People start killing each other. <laughs> There's also a prophecy we learn throughout this whole movie. And the prophecy, I think it was actually Trelawney who first said the prophecy. So, like, Probably she's either. not fake. She actually gets visions. Um, she realizes that Harry or Voldemort have to die. And last year we learned that you're going to die, but you're going to be happy about it. <laughs> yeah. And that is going to happen. So we do, but it leaves Harry knowing, thinking like, okay, like I'm going to have to die, but he doesn't know the full extent of it. He doesn't know how it's going to happen. Um, but he does see a little bit of his fate with that prophecy. And then also, um, Snape, triple agent. This is like the last year that they're at school. They don't. Yeah. Her Hermione goes back when the war's done, yeah. but the boys. This is the last time that they're gonna like see Hogwarts, um, and the only other time is going to be the Battle of Hogwarts. Um, so they they gone after this. They gone. Um, they gone. And I just wanted to cover the Hecate's crossroads of this because every single. Every single book has huge choices that everyone can kind of make, um, make different choices. And it's the choices that we're not real, even aware of that a lot of people need to just be aware of. And I think when fear is entered into the equation, people start making really, really stupid choices and yeah. they usually fall for the devil's schemes. So, um, we basically that what was important about the entire Snape killing scenario is that it was Snape who dis wait. No, 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 no. I'm going to say that wrong. Malfoy disarms Dumbledore. And that's how you legitimately get the Elder Wand. You can't just like take it. You can't be given it. You have to disarm it from the owner of the Elder Wand. So up until now, Dumbledore has been the owner of the elder wand which is one of the we're going to learn about it in the next videos but one of the deathly hollows it's the oldest wand ever made made of elder wood i also want to tell people the tree okay so it's actually a, a english folklore that the elder tree was the type of tree that Jesus was crucified on. So in Christianity, especially more so in just the area that Harry Potter is taking place, the United Kingdom area, there's a, they believe that 
Jesus was on an elder wood tree for his crucifixion for his crucifixion, which is why I we joked earlier saying, I don't think Jesus would like love his crucifix. Like what part of the story makes you think he would like the cross? And we were just joking about it. But that's why I was also joking about not loving the idea of having to utilize all of our magic on wands because wands if we depend on them too much, when the ministry starts tracking your magic on the wands and can locate you because you're using your magic on your wand and now you don't know any other magic outside of using that one conduit, you are sometimes put in a bad place. So um, it's just interesting to keep this in mind. Yes, I would love a wand. They're gorgeous. I'm sure it makes everything, I get the science behind having a conduit to make your magical reach go further. However, at that same token, the Harry Potter Legacy video game is literally about a girl goes to Hogwarts, doesn't know anything about magic until she was 15, has to learn everything really quickly to defeat her own little bad guy and she has a student along with her from africa and this magical like foreign exchange student from africa explains that their magic schools don't teach with wands like you can do magic without using a wand and i think that would be more beneficial sometimes in some scenarios so I think kids should maybe be taught a couple things without their wand um and that goes into if you what we were kind of joking about earlier the idolization of crucifix um but yeah it's just another myth that is out there regarding like religion and the tie to Harry Potter um and one of those three brothers from the Deathly Hollows also hangs himself at the end, right? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Um, we'll sad. get into that. Yeah, we'll get into that the very first next video. Um, nice. And it's more Trinity's work. Good tip, we- though, with the Elderwood. That was good. I didn't know that. Yes, I just read it. It's um, Elderwood is in the Bible. It's very interesting why they chose that. I'm not a fan of wants. That's why I haven't really brought them up too much. We will go into the story of wands in the next video. A lot of people want to talk about the wands and what's they're made out of. Yes, don't get me wrong. I want a wand. (laughs) I knew you were going to say that. You're like, I I make one. one. (laughs) I love them. I know which one I'm going to get. Rosewood with a 10 inch. Like I know my wand, but at the same token, I think it's very important that you realize your words are more powerful than any wand you'll ever have. Um, your blood is more powerful than the wand you'll ever have. Like we have so much more power in our bodies than need for a wand. And I honestly think the wand in Harry Potter is more about like, it's a Christian theme, weirdly enough, because of this elder aspect. Um, but yeah, so make the choice yourself. Uh, one choice that the devil is definitely going to push you into is to give into fear and illusion of Snape being truly bad and pick sides. And your fear is probably going to even give you bad guys loyalty. And we saw this a lot. A lot of people haven't liked any of my status, but they watch every single video and everything I do, because if they like my status, it might show people from high school that so-and-so liked your status. And they're like, Oh my God, like, she they're friends with her and that is very much what was happening during harry potter is like oh you're associated with them like it was this fear based picking of sides in the war um and the long haul the long road is going to be trust dumbledore hence trust the plan trust there is a plan that you don't know about trust that even when things look scary and the bad guy takes over it's fake and it was a psyop in order to make the plan happen and you might not know of the plan there's probably less than nine people in the whole world who know the plan because people suck at keeping secrets Mm -hmm. so there's a plan i promise you there's also prophecies no matter what travel channel tells you there are prophecies there are plans and no 
we're all going to be surprised. Yeah, they do <laughs> allude to it too. And the, as well, like when, after the sorting hat and they just open up the year, Dumbledore's like the dark force's greatest weapon is you and yep. referring to the children and their indoctrination of potential basically. And like to become this new legion of loveless, um, vicious killers basically, which is sort of, what they do in the universities and so on, like they really do take a lot of soul and heart out of their students through the practices they do and the the activities that is schooling is techniques to basically whittle down your frontal lobe a lot of the way <laughs> and a lot of your spirits. So, but the, it's good that the, it's weird and good how they also go into spirit and like still having a little bit of team spirit and a little bit of school spirit and a little bit of dressing up and a little bit of, you know, activity and fun and dignity for the children. And that comes into all of the films I've noticed, like they dignify the students really well in, in, in a good light for the most part. And I appreciate that because yeah, I think- Students in our realm need a lot more dignity than they're being provided right now. And they try to build them up. They really try to, I mean, it's, it's a magic school. You're literally trying to tell the kids you can create here is how to do it. And nowadays schools do, they make everything to, they don't want people to create. I was in sixth grade trying to make my floor plans, minding my own business. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and my teacher's like, stop it. Put your pencils down. Listen, look at the whiteboard. I'm like, I'm listening to you. I'm just making my floor plans. And <laughs> they would hate me for like creating. Um, and it's it's really yeah. funny how what I think so many people wanted from Harry Potter when we were kids reading it, like it was just the ability of, oh my God, like teachers are telling us how to be like them and nowadays it's not like that anymore nowadays it is trying to be like them like have a binary pronouns and like and all that bullshit which is why we have to take over the schools and why there is legislation trying to bring back the parental power to schools because yes the past five years whatever i can say really all the school shootings started happening only during obama every other week and um when he got out of office that stopped so really we can say that the ministry started infiltrating the schools back then um and then of course the kids had had to choose a different way and they literally had to go into hiding which is where we start the next movie review off Oh, the concept of going into hiding. That's a hunting one. Sometimes I really just like, what, just I'm like, can we just pretend like this isn't happening? <laughs> like, you know, but then obviously in our line of work, there's no way to, you can't ignore it for very long. It's like, you can't unsee it. You can't unknow it. But I do have these glimmers where I'm like, God, you know, what a it wouldn't be such a burden it wouldn't feel so heavy it wouldn't the stakes wouldn't seem so high if we just were ignorant and we could go back to sort of phase one um but then you know you look around you see the ignorant walking around and you're like no i i wouldn't want to be that at this stage but I know. And I, it took me a long time to start speaking out. My husband did a lot of roundtables early on and um, he was well more well known. And that's why it's called Ricky leaks. Cause it was really him leading the rails and uh, we would be watching people and they would be like spreading such fear porn or div- division, even within our good groups. And it was like, I wasn't putting my information out there. And then I started getting hurt and it was in my feet. I kept getting the weirdest accidents happening to my feet. I broke a couple of my baby, like when you hit your feet so hard, you, everyone says they break their little tiny feet, the little, <laughs> so a couple times in your life. And like I did back to back in 2018. And I was like, okay, I have to, I have to start making videos about the detox and it was I didn't want to do it I didn't want to come out I was in hiding but it was what finally made me do it was my husband and I got a new blender because we were like detox and we wanted to blend stuff and this blender was a ninja bullet and it came with the blender and the food processor and my husband and I we opened the box and we're like look at these and we he was looking at me and he didn't go like 
forceful. He just like, look at the blade. And that little tiny motion made this ninja blender blade fly out. You can't reach for it because it's going to chop off your hands. So it was slow motion. My husband and I <laughs> saw the blade go into my foot and it <gasps> went to the top of my foot and there was blood <laughs> everywhere. And it was, I didn't even. So great about that. <laughs> <laughs> horrible and um i thought i wouldn't be able to walk sure enough a few months later like i my foot would like fall out from under me and if you look up what do feet accidents symbolize it means that you're not stepping forward and you need to take the next step and if you don't it's only going to get worse and worse and worse and i I have we use stem cell patches, LifeWave X39 patches, and yeah. it has since saved me. But the first year after that, I thought I was going to have problems walking. Um, and it was very indicative of if you don't come out of hiding when you are supposed to, you are going to God is going to tell you like, OK, sweetie, it's time to it's it's time. No. And he'll start screaming and it will result in if you're not doing the mission you're going to be taken out because you're not doing your job. So as much as we want to stay in hiding, like you, you can't, you, and you'll know it. It's, it's really weird to explain. Well, since we're all out, what yeah. class would we be teaching at Hogwarts now that we're adults and we would have our own classroom in this beautiful castle? What would we be teaching? Jenny? I, for me, honestly, this may seem cliche, but I would love to be the defense against the dark arts teacher oh. as a Slytherin. Oh, I love I it. I would just be Snape. I would be the female version of Snape. I would be mean. Everybody would think I was like terrible, but really, you know, secretly, I'm not so bad. <laughs> <laughs> not so bad. <laughs> um, I would make... <laughs> I think so when the kids go to the Triwizard Tournament or the World Cup, they have that really cool tent. And then later on in the next <laughs> video, we see I'm an architect. I know where this is going. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then later on we see Hermione utilize a advanced spell where she can make like the Mary Poppins bag where it's just an infinite amount. And like I love floor plants. I'm an architect. Like that's my anagram or whatever. But um, I would really utilize because that magic spell where you can get a tiny little space and make a lot of make once you're in that space, it can be a huge wild wide world. That in itself is the three, six, nine principle that Tesla pushes so hard. You can make your own dimension. So I'm making my own dimension. Basically, you can make a huge area in a teeny tiny place. And everyone has to realize there is an infinite number between zero and one. There, there are infinite decimals and points between those two. And if you're ever in a hurry and you don't think you have enough time and you only have 15 minutes, there is an infinite number of seconds, milliseconds between the seconds. And if you can like harness yourself to that teeny tiny frame, you can actually, you're kind of like in between worlds and you can do a lot of magic there, which goes into more of the ancient magic, like Merlin and the Lady of the Lake kind of stuff. And that is the ancient magic that is no longer being really taught at Hogwarts. Um Molly's family is of that line. So I would bring back some of these ancient magic to the kids um, from the medieval times that I know we have lost. And also, like, I think the end of your project is everyone has to make a really cool tent and, like, have as many rooms in that teeny tiny tent. And that's, like, how you would. You put a lot of thought. She's like, and I have an end of year project for you. Okay, here is the floor plan. Yeah. Show me your floor plan. And what you're actually doing is making a dimension within a teeny tiny space. Yeah. And what about you, Miss Alexis? Oh, I was thinking like just rapidly, like, I don't have an answer, but like, uh, I'd probably take over Trelawney's classroom. That would be fun. And maybe 
Madam Hooch's job. Maybe that would. I was gonna say Madam Hooch. Oh, that would be fun. I want to fly. She teaches them to fly their broomsticks, but like poorly supervises them in the first. <laughs> She's like a the witch. Like a, her. I'm taking yeah. her job. Like you know, like everybody's got like there's always like a she always reminded me of like the lesbian gym teacher. <laughs> oh, my husband loves her. So like I could, I was gonna say Alexis. <laughs> you um as like a very young youthful version of McGonagall um like I could see you chilling as a cat or an owl and you're just hanging out waiting for everybody to come in and then all of a sudden you know boom there she is and it's like whoa yeah that's right <laughs> I mean Hagrid Hagrid's job is cool though Yes, yes, I was going to say wandering around in the forest is another thing. <laughs> yeah. And with the baby, like the all, all the little all animals, cheaper. like that'd be so cute. Smell bad, but it'd be cute. <laughs> yes, it, the one spell I didn't mention also that I thought was really cute was when Hermione was making little birds when she was super sad, and then she oh, says no. Oh, no and like sends them all to like smash Ron to bits. Ron. You and you're like, I'm writing that down. <laughs> and it was because she was sad that they were able to attack. It used that sadness of her. Um, oh another God. thing that I didn't really realize until I played the games, I hate the Gryffindor common room. I hate it so much. It's ugly. I don't like maroon. <laughs> She's Ugh. like, the colors, the floor plan of the Gryffindor. I would change the floor plan of Gryffindor. I would get kicked out. They're like, stop changing the floor plan of Gryffindor. I'm like, oh, this needs to, well, you guys need a whole re This does not look enough like a lion's den. Like, what is, I'm just kidding. <laughs> exactly. Um, but I really do love all three of the other ones. Let's, uh, Slytherin is under the lake. So they see the inside, the bottom of the lake. So they see the mermaids and everything, and it's like this green cast, and it is in the dungeon, so it's dark and, like, cold. I wouldn't like that part, but they don't show it great in the movies. Like, it's not that pretty, but it's gorgeous in the books, and it is gorgeous in the um, video game they came out with. Ravenclaw is beautiful, and there's books everywhere. It's just a huge library and purple and, like, very comfy cozy. And then Hufflepuff probably, I think, has the best yeah. room. Yeah. It's, like books and herbs and like plants and light coming in and it's just gorgeous but um i always get gryffindor whenever i do the stupid things i'm like well i'm gonna change your freaking common room just so you know <laughs> <laughs> maybe grow a plant in there yeah whatever so thank you girls for joining me this is the end of hogwarts our hogwarts journey next book we're gonna be on the run we're going to be um trying to kill horcruxes and gathering horcruxes a lot of our friends are going to be tortured people are going to die things are going to die and then we're going to be happy at the end so i'm excited you're going to suffer but you're going to be happy about it <laughs> yeah you're going to suffer you're going to be happy about it that's it thank Love you girls you. oh thank you for having us thank you as always you guys this is always um a lot of fun it is. Thank you. Um, all right. Anything else on parting words? Did we get to all of your notes, Alexis? I would say we did a, a decent job. Just honorable mention to Luna's lion mascot hat yes. headpiece. One of my favorite parts of this film is the costume design for that one. She just rocks it. Her costume design both times, both of her major good. scenes there were really good. Big fan of her character. I'm glad they added her in and used her a little more in the films than they did maybe in the books. So that was great. And yeah, next mm -hmm. it's it's tough because we're going from childlike wonder. Like this is just the last little bit. Like oh, mm -hmm. you're having ice cream at a dinner party and your teacher cares about you. And now it's like okay, the next one, next next one of these we're gonna do is gonna be very intense and a lot more in the adult world. And yes. applicable to our lives today as well. And the horcruxes that live amongst us, including Taylor Swift's collection, whatever she's got going on. And it's funny because you expose to us muggles in a way that this horcruxing exists. And like, this is kind of what this film does is the teacher taught this technology and like this was in the library at the school, this information and it's, it's there. And, Dumbledore knew about it, but wasn't 100% sure. Like, and 
this this moment of this horrible tech or this horrible magic potential like to kill someone and tre- like tear yourself apart just to be able to like persist on this really long term evil plan and not be killed while you're doing while you're killing and all these like fail safes that the dark side is doing just to be able to live and go and persist this like twisted narrative all this effort to just last to try and get your plan done instead of what these kids are doing which is just in the moment and existing and they don't have this understanding of all this plotting and this planning and this lack of love and so i think this book series and everything gives a good insight on that and like how a broken child can cause a lot of problems and so if you are seeing one in your school or in your groups or in your families like give them the extra attention to open their hearts because you could save the whole planet basically yeah. in that effort too. So I think that's an important part of, I like yeah. that of that series too. So again, thanks for doing this today. I'm glad we recorded. Thanks for all the interest in watching. I hope you enjoy listening and please leave your comments. So we know not to miss your favorite parts of the ending of this whole shebang as well. And the fly that lives in my room says hello. Yes, the fly that was hey, how <laughs> your agent that's following you around. Yeah, that's what I we're in, we have it's a love thing. Loves me to death. <laughs> oh, okay, well, it's audio or then. something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Imagine. Yeah. All right. Until All right, next time. Bye, everybody. See Bye, guys. It's recording. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't make any noise or anything. Okay. And let's go back. Five, four, three, two, one.